Hi. Good to see you guys. Welcome back from spring break. Um, my name is Reza Shadmer, and um, I uh, study the motor system. Um, in my laboratory, um, we look at um, healthy individuals, people that have motor disorders because of cerebellar dysfunction, Parkinson's disease, and we also uh, record from the brain, um, record from single neurons in the, um, uh, in the cerebellum of uh, primates. So we study how movements are made. And, and the basic story of movements is that you make movements in order to acquire things that um, are rewarding to you. So you decided to come to class today. That was a decision you made based on rewards and efforts that you could have had. You know, maybe there was something that was more rewarding than coming to class and that's what made people not come to class. Um, for, for you, that was the rewarding action. So you made a decision based on some measure of uh, utility. And that resulted in a movement, which meant you walked across the campus and came to class. The way you make movements is an expression of how you evaluate the goal, um, which is basically to say uh, you move faster toward things that you value more. You make faster eye movements, faster arm movements, you walk faster. I mean, all you got to do is, you know, when you're at the airport, pay attention to how people move toward each other. People who care about each other move faster toward each other, right? Wife, child, husband, wife, they run toward each other. But the person who's coming out of the airport waiting for the guy who's going to take him on a limo, he doesn't run toward that person. Right? It would be very strange if they did that. Mm -hmm. So the way you express your movement is related to the way you value things that are the goals of the movement. <clears throat> Today, what I want to do is to show you a little bit about how mathematically we think about control of movements. It should have something to do with rewards and efforts. And then what's the neural basis of that control? So we're going to look at how Parkinson's disease affects the way people move, a little bit about that. How cerebellar disorders affect the way people move. And then think about them in terms of these costs and rewards. Why those things affect the way movements take place. And as, as I go along, ask questions. Raise your hands. I'm happy to answer the best that I can. So, voluntary movements. And that's my name, Reza Shadmer. Any questions so far? All right, <clears throat> so let's begin. So this slide, what it says is that what separates plants and animals is that animals can move voluntarily. And the fundamental reason why we have a nervous system is so we can move. So we can move and improve our state. Here's a sea cucumber. And what it does is that it basically, in its larval form, it has a few neurons it searches for a place to find a home. Once it finds its home, it plants itself, and it's never going to move again. So it dissolves its nervous system. It eats its own nervous system. It has a nervous system only for the purpose of finding a home. And then, once it finds it, it just stays there forever, and it won't be needing its nervous system anymore, so it gets rid of it. All right, take a look at this picture. Suppose I could measure your eye movements as you're looking at this picture. What would I see? What I would see is that you spend most of your time looking at the bears. Hardly anybody is really interested in the bottom of the tree over here. And those eye movements say a lot about how you put value on visual information. And this is a very important piece of information for people who sell advertisements. So when they want to put advertisement on a web page, they want to know what is it that attracts your attention. So what attracts your attention? What do you think? Why did you look at those bears? If I had cats, maybe it would attract your attention even more. 
If I had faces of humans, perhaps it would attention it would attract your attention more. If I had faces of females, it would perhaps attention attract your attention even further. So we direct our gaze, our eyes, toward places that have value. And so you can imagine that this scene here was like a map of value in your brain and there were peaks in it. And those peaks were where? Where you directed your eyes, which happened to be where these bears are. So <clears throat> you move toward things that you value. And the value of those movements affects how you're going to move. So let me show you something about this process of incorporating costs and rewards. Suppose I have you reach to a circle. It's kind of hard to see, this blue, greenish thing here. And I'm going to give you 100 points if you hit that circle. Now, of course, what's going to happen is that you're going to try to hit it, maybe throw darts, let's say, and there'll be some variance in how you throw. And here's the variance. But mean is going to be more or less centered at the center of that circle. Now, suppose I give you this option of if you hit this region, you're going to get 100 points. But if you hit this region, which is, again, I apologize, hard to see with this projector, you're going to get penalized, minus 200. So here's the penalty region, and here's the reward region, this region here. So then what you should do is you should aim a little bit to the right. You're going to miss more frequently, but you're going to avoid that penalty. If I increase the penalty to 500, you're going to aim even further away. Do you see that? So by aiming farther away, you're trying to maximize your reward while minimizing the penalty. In the way we make movements, rewards are things that we get after we arrive. Penalty is the effort that we spent getting there. So movements cost, cost you things. When you move your body, you spend energy. And, to, and on Wednesday, we'll talk a little bit about the energetic cost of the movement. In your brain, there is representation of the energy that you're spending as you're making movements. When you get to the end of your movement, you acquire the thing that you were moving toward. You harvest that reward. And so the movements you make are a balance between the effort you spend in order to acquire the good thing at the end. So then why is it that this father and the mother run toward their child and the child runs toward them? Because they value the reward that you're going to get at the end more than if they were walking toward a stranger or somebody that they didn't care so much about. So the effort that they're willing to spend is discounted by the reward that they're going to get. So what this says, look, if you're going to learn anything from today's lecture is this. If you want to know how somebody feels about you, you should pay attention to how they move toward you. Okay, if you get that part, we're good. All right, so suppose now that we change. We increase your variance. Suppose you have a disease, that when you move, you have variability in your movement. So here, here's the movements that you make. Now, in order for you to avoid the penalty, you're going to have to aim a little bit farther to the right. And if the penalty gets bigger, you have to aim even farther to the right. So basically, the way you move depends on the costs and rewards of the task. And if you have variability in the way you move, maybe you're an athlete and you can make that movement with low variability. On the other hand, maybe you're a couch potato and the movement that we're considering isn't particularly in your foray. So maybe it's a tennis serve. And if you're a good tennis player, you can reproducibly produce the goal. And you should aim to the corner of the tennis court. Whereas if you're a novice, you should aim at the center because your variability will make it so that you're unlikely to hit it. Okay, let me stop to see if you have a question. Give me one question. Yes, sir. So over here, what I have is that what happens if you have normal variance, whereas increased variance. So here's a healthy individual. Here's a person that has a motor disorder. Thank you for that question. 
All right, ask me questions. Because otherwise, you know, it's just no fun. It's like me talking to the wall. I got to get back and forth. Any other questions? All right. Okay, so how do we assign value? Why is it that you view the image of somebody you love more than somebody that you don't know? Why is it that picture in, you know, makes it so that you're going to move faster toward it? Well, because you've learned the value of that image, right? That person represents something for you, and you've learned it. You can also have a representation of value to places. Maybe your bedroom at home. Maybe your kitchen. Maybe a place that uh, has significance for you because of its emotional salience. How do we learn to assign value to places versus how do we learn to assign, assign value to things? So I'm going to show you that learning to assign value to places depends on the hippocampus. Whereas learning to assign value to things, objects, depends on the basal ganglia. So here's an exa experiment that looks at assigning value to places. So here's a mouse. He's swimming in this milky water. So, you know, they hate to get wet. And so what they're looking for is a platform to stand on. And what one can do is do an experiment where that platform is always at the same location with respect to markers on the wall. So for example, the platform is going to be close to this triangle. So all the mouse has to do is to look at the wall to find out where the triangle is and then it'll find the, the platform. And that'll get it to be, get out of the water. Okay? Yeah. So this is, this is the basic experiment. Now, if the hippocampus is damaged, what happens is that uh, the animal just swims and swims and swims, despite the fact that many times in the past it has experienced this position-value relationship, it just can't seem to remember that here's the location where the, you know, I'm going to be able to get out of this terrible scenario that I'm in. Okay? So the mutant hippocampal damaged mouse doesn't learn to value to position association. Now, let's do the same experiment, but put a flag on top of the place where the platform was. So here, there's this flag that says, here's the place where you're going to be able to get out of the water. And there's another flag as well, but that flag doesn't correspond to a, uh, a platform. It's a tiny thing that will attract your attention, but it's not big enough that you can get out of the water. It's too small. So you have to learn that this platform is the one that I want, this, this, this flag. Now, the, the di difficulty in the task is that it's not that always it's going to be next to the triangle. It's going to be anywhere. So on some trials, it's going to be up. Some trials, it's going to be down. What you have to learn is assign value to the flag, not to its location. OK? And what happens is that basal ganglia deficits in these mice prevents them from learning to assign these values. And so they swim and swim, and you know, they can't learn it. Whereas hippocampal damage has no effect on this particular kind of learning. So value associations of places to things depend on different neural structures. Questions? Yeah. Use value association and memory So learning requires memory. So, you know, there there is a component of memory that may be immediate and there may be a component of it that lasts. And so in this case they're looking at trial to trial. So there even if there's learning, there has to be something that is remembered for it to be expressed. Now, we haven't talked about what kind of learning is causing this kind of a, you know, deficit. And is it, you know, if it's like a short-term memory deficit that was affected or long-term memory, that haven't, we haven't discussed. Okay. Now, how does this learning play, takes place? Well, you know, what has to happen is that you're going to learn the value of the place or the object because of some neurotransmitter that's going to say, oh, that feels great, right? And that's dopamine. When something 
is better than you expected, you get this rush of dopamine from these neurons in deep, deep in the brain in two regions. A part of the basal ganglia called substantia nigra and a part of the pons called ventral, uh, ventral tegmental area. They give rise to these neurons, the sender projections throughout the brain, and they release dopamine. And one of the really major discoveries of the last 20 years has been the role of dopamine in learning of value. What is rewarding, what is not rewarding. What is better than expected, what is worse than expected. And by assigning reward to the stimuli around us, we form these value functions, which then allows us to make decisions, which then influences how we move. So let me show you an example of dopamine. So dopamine is, an example of it is, is in series of slides that you see here. And what happens is that basically a monkey is sitting down and looking at a screen and a, a picture comes on at this time, stimulus is here. Now this picture normally doesn't, ha doesn't do anything for the animal. You know, there's some maybe a fractal image or something like that and then it goes away. Occasionally, at a, a few seconds after the stimulus came on, all of a sudden the monkey gets a bit of juice. Now, what happens is that to train the monkey, what you do is that you basically water restrict or food restrict them so that they're motivated. So when they get the juice, when they get the food, they're, you know, wow, that was great. Okay? So, normally, this picture when it comes on the screen, there is, you know, nothing happens. But, occasionally, when the picture comes, there is this bit of juice that is delivered to the animal at about a second later. And here's when the juice comes. So, there's this burst of dopamine that takes place right afterwards because the animal wasn't expecting it. And all of a sudden, something good happened. Now, if the probability of juice is increased from infrequent to a little bit more, a quarter, this is the probability, to a half, to 100%, something interesting happens. So, if initially the monkey has no idea that this picture is going to be associated with this bit of reward, then when the reward comes, there's this bit of dopamine that's released. On the other hand, with training, as the monkey learns that this picture always going to give me this reward, what happens is that the monkey gets the dopamine when the picture is presented, not when the juice is delivered. So effectively, the picture becomes like the juice. And so, there's this reinforcement. The picture is good. It's going to give me juice. And when the juice actually comes, there is no, no change in the dopamine response. It's at baseline. Now, what's interesting is that if the picture came on and there was no juice, then dopamine response goes to zero. So that's worse than what you expected. Big increase when it was surprising, you got something good, little bit down to zero when it was not there. I was expecting it and it didn't come. So you are seeing how it is telling you there's this reward that I didn't expect and I got. That's great. I get this dopamine response. And then once I get used to it, yeah, this thing is going to give me dopamine. When I see the picture, I get the dopamine response. I don't actually have to wait to get the juice. Yes, sir. That's a great question. So what you're saying is that does the reward rate history influence your dopamine levels? And, you know, it's, it's contentious. We don't know the answer. So what happens is that when, you know, when, when you look at how people react, so if something bad happens to you and if you're feeling depressed, you definitely are influenced in how you move. Your posture changes. You walk a little bit slower. You know, I don't need to ask you if you're depressed. All I got to do is look at you, and I can see the way you move isn't the way you normally move. So I would infer that there's something different about the baseline levels of dopamine. But that, scientifically, I don't know the answer to that, whether that, that is indeed the case. Yeah. 
Right. Exactly. So you unlearn. Basically, you, you know, and unlearning takes longer than learning. So learning that something is good takes just a little while. But learning that the thing that used to be good is bad takes a long time, which is kind of sad. But that's the way our brain works. It takes us a long time to understand something that used to be good before is no longer good. And it's in the dopamine response. It has a big ups, upscale. We can move up quickly, but it has a lo it, it, you know, going down is just a, it's just a small amount. Which I think ecologically, maybe it makes sense because it says you should take a chance. You know, if something used to be good in the past, um, what's you got, what do you got to lose? Imagine that it's going to be good again. Okay. All right. So um, let me show you now this example, the idea that it takes us very quickly to learn that something is good, but takes us a little bit longer to realize that it's no longer good. So in this experiment, what's happening is that a monkey is moving his eyes. And so, you know, although I talk about these things as if we're talking about our lives, of course in the laboratory, you know, we're talking about monkeys or mice making tiny movements and getting juice. So, you know, you might imagine what I just told you about learning things that have to do with reward and punishment takes, you know, an asymmetric amount. In the lab, it's a much simpler world. What the monkey does is that it moves his eyes to the left, and in the, some block of trials, moving to the left means you're going to get juice. Moving to the right means you get nothing. And then, at some random interval, the world changes. Now moving to the right means you're going to get juice. Moving to the left means you're going to get nothing. I'm going to see how behavior changes and how neurons in the basal ganglia respond. So, here on this plot is what's called saccade latency. So that is how quickly I respond. I move my eyes to the direction where I expect reward versus the direction where I expect to get nothing. So, so by the way, why does the monkey at all do this task? Why does the monkey move his eyes to the side that he won't get nothing for it? Well, because if he doesn't do it, then you just repeat the trial, basically. He can't move to the trial where he's going to get juice unless he completes. It's like a cost that he's got to pay. Make a movement and live with the fact that you're going to get nothing. Okay. So on this axis is saccade latency, and it's about 300 milliseconds here. And you see that these movements are made to the direction where there is no reward. Now in this trial, all of a sudden, this first blue trial, the monkey makes a saccade in a direction where he was not expecting to get reward, but he gets reward. On the very next trial, the reaction time falls to 200 milliseconds and then stays there. So now he expects reward in that direction and he's happy about it. He's making vigorous movements. At this first trial here, the first red trial here, he made the saccade in the direction where he wasn't expecting, re was he was expecting reward, but he didn't get reward. And notice how slowly he returns back to the direction that he was before. So he learns quickly and then unlearns slowly. Now, let's look at the basal ganglia. Here's a cell in a region of the basal ganglia called the caudate, which is an input region in the input of the uh, basal ganglia, the caudate neuron. The caudate neuron fires a little bit when you're not going to get reward. It rises up quickly when it expects reward, stays up high, and then it falls slowly when it again has learned that this thing is no longer rewarding. Questions? Does it make sense? The asymmetry? Remember what dopamine was doing? Big spike when the thing was unexpectedly good, a little bit down when it's not so good. So the learning is asymmetric. OK. So let's now step back and ask, how do we make movements? Well, clearly, the way we make movements has something to do with what we expect to get at the end of the movement. Am I reaching for a, you know, an apple or am I reaching for a donut? If I'm reaching for a donut, I like donuts. I'm going to reach faster toward it. So there's a reward that's higher for me because I'm reaching for the donut. There may be a cost to be paid. While I'm moving my arm, 
and that means I'm going to have to spend effort doing it. And so perhaps somebody with a different arm, maybe a, somebody who has lower metabolic costs, will make that same move and make it faster. I need to take into account my effort that I'm going to spend and what's at stake and put that together and that becomes a cost that's here. Expected rewards and costs. And so that becomes what's called a control policy. That means that I'm going to describe for you how this movement is about to take place. The vigor of my movement that's about to take place depends on what's at stake. What are the costs? What are the rewards? Those things determine how I'm going to generate this movement. So I'm now going to generate some motor commands. These motor commands are going to come out of my cortex, out of my superior colliculus. They're going to move my eyes. They're going to move my arm. As I generate these motor commands, there's a part of my brain that makes predictions about what's about to happen. That's called a forward model. That's my cerebellum. My cerebellum is listening to these commands that I'm being generating and it says, what, here's what's about to happen. And the, the importance of that is that it allows you to make predictions and not have to rely on the slow sensory feedback that your body has been born with. So, we will see examples of that. We will see that if you had only the sensory feedback to rely on, it's too slow. You get delayed feedback and your movements aren't so good. And so people who have cerebellar disorders, they get tremors because the feedback that's coming is delayed and they don't have a mechanism in place that makes predictions so they can't compensate for that delay. So you have a mechanism that generates motor commands based on costs and rewards, a mechanism that makes predictions and then you get the sensory feedback, and that allows you to complete your movement. Okay, so let's look at these motor commands. All right, here's the high jump in the Olympics. I want you to imagine the process of determining how to jump a high bar. So there's a bar here, and you're going to jump over it. And I'm going to show you three individuals and how they change the way they jump. So here's Ethel Catherwood in 1928, Cornelius Johnson in 1936, and then Dick Fosbury, an engineering student, in 1968. So it used to be people jumped over a high bar in the Olympics using this paradigm, which is like a scissor. So the idea is, what, what's at stake here? What's at stake is that a gold medal. That's what you're jumping for. Now, what are the costs associated with this jump? Well, if you look at the way Ethel has to jump, she has to jump on grass. Now, how does Dick Fosbury jump? Does he jump on grass? No. What does he jump on? A mat. A pretty cushy mat. So the risk of jumping scenario is that if Ethel was jumping like this, she would probably break her neck. Why? Because Dick Fosbury is going to land on his neck. And you don't want to do that from a height of two meters onto grass. So the development of the high jump was a process by which individuals learned how to alter their movements in order to jump as high as possible by minimizing risk. So you see an example of a control policy. How to maximize the height of a jump given that am I going to land on a piece of hard ground or on a matted surface. So I'm going to jump differently if I'm going to land on a matted surface. Now, how does one measure these costs and rewards in a laboratory? Here's an example of it. So what one can do is that to introduce cost, what one can do is to say, well, if you reach and hit the target, you're going to get some points, but nearby the target, there's going to be these regions where they're going to have penalty. And so you can make the target small and the penalty region big, or you can make the penalty region small and the target big. And the, what one finds is that the speed by which individuals move depends on the size of the target and the size of the penalty. So here's a task. You hold a pen in your hand, you have a goal region and you have an error region. And you tell the person, I want you to hit as many times the goal region, let's say in a 30 second period. 
And what you see people doing is that as you increase the width of the goal, so if you go from a small region to a large region of the goal, you see that the speed of the movement becomes larger, the movement time becomes smaller. So this, di this distance here is on the x-axis, the movement time is on the y-axis, and then the width of the goal is each one of these lines. So as the goal becomes bigger, people move faster. Right? So, which means that basically, when you move fast with your arms, you tend to have greater variance in how you're going to control it. So if the idea is to be precise, then you probably should move slower. But the problem is if you move slow, then you won't have enough time to you know, get as many hits as possible. So the way one can look at these costs and rewards in a task is through manipulation of things like target size and a penalty region in an experiment in a laboratory. Any questions so far? All right. And of course one can do the same thing with arm movements. You don't have to do it with the finger movements and the target. You could have them make arm movements. And what you see is that there are these velocity profiles for the arm. As you see here, as you make reaching movements, you have these nice, what's called bell-shaped velocity profiles. And that tells you that, well, the policy that the brain has learned to produce in order to make a movement from A to B is to produce a velocity that's more or less symmetric and that allows it to arrive on target fairly accurately. Saccades, which are another form of movement, these are our eye movements, have a different shape. So what you see here is a duration of a saccade in milliseconds as a function of amplitude. It turns out that you make about two saccades every second. And during every saccade, you're blind. So, in a course of a day, you make about 100,000 saccades. Each saccade takes, say, on average, 50 milliseconds, has a velocity of 500 degrees per second, and what this means is that through the course of a day, you are <laughs> blind for about an hour and a half. That's like crazy, right? So, saccades are one of those movements that we do as mammals, as primates, because we have a fovea. And what the fovea allows us to do is to direct our eyes. It's like a high-resolution camera. It allows us to direct our eyes to the place where we are most interested. And we make saccades that depend on what's at stake, what's the goal. I make a saccade toward a face at a higher velocity than if I'm making a saccade toward this chair. So, here's the future. You go to the restaurant. The waiter brings a tray of desserts. What do you do? You look at these plates with your eyes, you saccade back and forth, and then you say, I like the chocolate cake with raspberries. But, if the restaurant has cameras, they can measure your saccades. And what they can see is that your velocity of the eye as it moves from plate to plate is highest toward the chocolate with raspberries. They don't need to ask you what you prefer. They know what you prefer. <laughs> so, the future, I think, as this kind of research progresses, is that they not only know what you prefer, they know how much more you prefer it than the second option. And that'll be the price you have to pay. <laughs> so our movements, our movements betray our secrets. Because they betray the value system that makes our choices. You know, we say we prefer A to B, but our eyes tell us what we really prefer. And the vigor by which we mo move our eyes tell us the amount that we prefer A to B. So that's the promise of neuroscience and studying motor control, is to understand truly what makes us, you know, prefer A to B. And I don't, I don't, you know, I don't mean to underestimate really the value of this in the future. There's a whole field of economics 
and psychology that's been developed to understand choices. What neuroscience is doing is finding the neural basis of those things. And you know, then the economics becomes neuroeconomics, because really what matters isn't your choices, but the neural system that made those choices. So saccades are a perfect example of it. You value animate objects, so when I show you an image that has bears in it, you spend your time looking at the bears, because you value it more. And if I wanted to know how much more you value those bears compared to the trees, I would have to measure the velocity by which you made those saccades and see how much bigger it is. Yeah? So in your example of the dessert tray, yeah. how do you account for the difference in gustatory preferences versus visual preferences? Ah, excellent point. So visual things have salience to them. So there could be brightness, there could be motion, there could be contrast. And when you're in a time crunch, those things matter a lot. So you go to the grocery store, there's a, a hundred jams. What attracts your attention first isn't the, you know, the, the thing you like in terms of things, you know, low calories, good taste, that kind of stuff. The thing that attracts your attention is its color, its position on the shelf, what is it next to, its contrast. And if you're in a hurry, you're going to make a stupid mistake. You're going to buy the thing that looks good, but may not be the thing you really want. Any other questions? All right. So how do we write this mathematically, this idea that there are costs? Well, we need to have some measure of, you know, where is this thing that I want to go? So I have an image to one side. That's the thing that I want to move toward. And therefore, I should take the position of my eye and put it at the target and maybe square it like this. And then I have to generate some motor commands, U. So I'm going to have to move my eyes from A to B. That's going to require some effort. So, you know, for example, if I have to look to the left like this, look to the left, look to the left, that's pretty painful after a while. Why? Because holding my eyes eccentrically is more effortful than holding it straight ahead. So if there's some face that I want to look at, it's cheaper for me to look at it straight ahead than like this. And if I really like the face, I'll look at it over here, but it better be really good. <laughs> right? So because it costs effort to look. Okay. And then there's this cost of time. What's the cost of time? If I promise you a dollar, is it better to give you this dollar today or tomorrow? Dollar is better today than tomorrow. All rewards are better sooner than later. Time discounts reward. It's better for me to acquire the rewarding thing earlier than later. The problem is, the earlier it is, the faster I have to move to get there, which means I have to spend greater effort. So, you have reward that you're trying to get. It's going to cost you, in terms of motor commands, to get there. And you want to get that reward soon, because that makes it more valuable. But the soon means you're going to have to move fast. And the faster you move, the more effort you have to pay. These are the things that make this decision making of how you move depend on these costs and efforts. All right. There's something interesting to the side. During the eye movement, I'm effectively blind, so I want to get there soon. A fast movement requires large motor commands, and the policy is to try to find a way to move the eyes to the target as soon as possible. Okay. Now let me show you <clears throat> this concept of variance. Why is it that it's hard to make fast movements? It's because our motor system, when it's pushed, it can produce high forces, but then the variance in those forces grows. And this is a concept that's called signal-dependent noise. What it means is that the noise in the system grows as the mean value of the input grows. <coughs> so if you want to produce three newtons of force, your noise may be this much. But if you want to produce 30 newtons of force, the noise is going to become this much. So the variance of the signal grows as the size of the input grows. So let me show you that. 
Here's a person making voluntary forces, so they're pushing on a transducer. On the y-axis is force, which is written as percent maximum voluntary contraction. So they're producing 25% of their maximum voluntary Once they produce this force, visual feedback is taken away, and then you look at the variance of their force. When they're producing small amounts of force, the variance is small. When they're producing large amounts of force, the variance is large. So the variance, which is shown here, the standard deviation of the force, grows as a function of the mean force. And this is the neurons that are generating this. They're going to become noisier when their input to them grows in magnitude. So this means that you, know, you may want to move fast, but that produces certain inaccuracies at the end of the movement which we saw you know with this task where you have to move your hand back and forth okay now let me show you an example of this forward model hmm. let's see if it shows us this Okay, so what happens? You have a book in your hand and you're holding it. If I pick up the book myself, my hand stays steady. But if you pick up the book off of my hand, I can see it. I can see you moving your hand. But I can't react fast enough, and so my arm moves up. The reason for this is that if I am the person doing the action, my brain can predict the consequences of my action. My brain can predict that as I'm lifting the book, a mass will be removed, and therefore I should precisely reduce the activity in my biceps so my arm doesn't do that. It stays still. If I am the person who's performing the action, I am privy to those motor commands. I can predict their consequences and I can correct for them as they occur. But if you are the person that's performing that action on me, I, can have to, I have to rely on my sensory feedback. And my sensory feedback is slow. And so therefore, I can only react to what you do to me. My arm goes up like this. So you can see an example of this if you were to take your phone and do a video like this. So walk with your phone at a place where there are signs on the street so that you can then look at your phone and see how well you can read those signs on your phone. Then compare it to when you yourself are walking down the street and are looking at the same signs. So when you are walking down the street, what happens? Well, your foot hits the ground. Every time your foot hits the ground, every time my foot hits the ground, there's a small displacement of my head downward, like this. That means that for me to keep looking and being able to read, my eyes have to move slightly upward so that it can keep that image perfectly still on my fovea. It's a miracle, it really is a miracle that we are not affected by our own motions. I can read while I'm walking. But that is a tremendous feat. Why? Because your brain is able to move your eyes and compensate for the motion of your head. But if you don't have that compensation, like your camera on your phone, it just bobbles up and down. So the lesson from this, this part of the lecture, you're at a fancy dinner party. The waiter comes with a tray of drinks. Who should pick up the drink? You or the waiter? The waiter. Let it give it to you. Right? So otherwise, his hand is going to go up. See? The things you learn in this class that will help you in your life. <laughs> All right, um, let me skip this. Let me now show you the, what happens if you don't have a cerebellum. So sometimes, because of odd genetic disorders, people are born without a cerebellum, or that their cerebellum 
degenerates as they get older. And here's an example of one of these patients, patient HK. Here's the MRI. So normally the cerebellum would be here. You see it's empty. So here's an experiment on this person. So what they're going to do is to hold the ball in their hand and then drop it onto this basket. Now this basket is attached to this force transducer in their hand. So normally, if you are holding this ball and you're dropping it, that ball is going to hit this basket and for you to hold the basket, you should grip a little harder just at the time when you expect the ball to hit the basket, right? Because otherwise the thing is going to fall out of your hand. So, if you're a healthy person, when you drop the ball, you don't just drop it, you also grip the force transducer in anticipation of when that ball is going to hit the basket. Does that make sense? Do you see the basic idea? Okay, what the patient is going to do is that they're not going to be able to do that. They're going to drop the ball, the ball is going to hit the basket, they're going to react to that force rather than predict the force. On the other hand, if the experimenter is holding the ball and they drop the ball, well, it's the same scenario as you picking up the book off my hand. You know, I, I can only react to what you're doing. I can't predict it. So therefore, what one sees is that in the case where a healthy person, as well as the cerebellar patient, is holding this force transducer in their hand, and now the experimenter drops the ball, what happens is that they only react. Their, their grip force increases after the ball hits the basket, rather than in anticipation of it. Does this make sense? All right, so that's, that's the basic story. So here's the actual result. So here's when the ball is impacting the basket. Here's the acceleration of the hand. Here's the grip force here. This is the healthy subject. This is the cerebellar patient. In this case, this is just the experimenter dropping the ball. And so if the ball hits the basket, time later you see that they grip the force. And that's the case also with the patient. So both the patient and the healthy individuals have a normal sensory system. They react to this event. Now, if the patient is themselves holding the ball and dropping it, they also behave as if all they can do is react. Whereas the healthy individuals does it earlier. They predict and in anticipation of the event, they begin gripping the transducer a little bit stronger. So our ability to make predictions about sensory consequences depends on the cerebellum. Any questions? All right, so here's some mathematics that we can use to represent what I was just telling you. We have our arm that has some state, x, position, velocity. We generate some motor commands, u, that causes a change. We have some sensory feedback, y, that we can measure. We have some costs and rewards that we want to minimize. We form a control policy that tells us how to do the movement. And I'm not going to go into the details of these equations for you in this class. If you're interested to learning about how this takes place, I teach a different class. It's called Mathematical Foundations of Biomedical Engineering, and you're welcome to take it, and we can talk about how to take these equations and think about control of behavior. All right, so the final thing I want to show you is uh, the basal ganglia and examples of what happens to that cost-reward um, problem. So I'm sure many of you have seen or um, had the unfortunate um, uh, thing in your life where you have a family member who has Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is a disease that affects the basal ganglia because it causes death in the dopaminergic system. The dopamine neurons degenerate progressively through life. And one of the hallmarks of Parkinson's disease is what's called bradykinesia, which means the slowness of the movement. And the way we think about that is that it used to be, we used to think that, you know, maybe they just don't know how to make movements, that the ability to make movements have been, has been lost. But what we've learned is that Parkinson's disease affects this cost-benefit ratio that the brain needs to have. And by losing dopamine, it appears that the brain is losing the reward value of why the movement is being done, and therefore everything seems so effortful, and there the movements become slowed 
and moreover, the movements become small, which is called uh, micrographia. Here's an example of it. So here's a patient with lesion of the striatum, which is the input to the, um, to the basal ganglia. And what you see is that you ask them to write TBZE with the affected side, they'll write tiny, with the other side, they write big. So basically, the effort it takes to produce a movement has been increased because the expected reward has been decreased. This economic relationship between reward and effort is affected when there's damage to the basal ganglia and it is expresses itself throughout our movements. All right, let me summarize. We have a nervous system in order to make voluntary movements and acquire rewarding states. We figure out what to do by looking at the rewards and costs that are available for us. If we have to assign reward to places, we assign it through the hippocampus. Maybe this room has become more valuable to you today because of the reward that you acquired, or maybe not. The reward that we assign to objects comes from the role that dopamine plays and its engagement of the basal ganglia. How to do it depends on taking rewards, taking costs, and forming what are called control policies. These policies determine how we'll produce motor commands and respond to sensory feedback. Internal models are the models that our cerebellum builds that make sensory consequences of motor commands. They predict what's about to happen. And so if I am going to pick up this thing off my hand, I can do it and maintain my arm perfectly still despite the fact that I removed the mass. And that ability to do that is because I have a model that tells me as you're about to do this, you need to turn off your biceps by precisely the amount that requires this stability. And what we saw was that the cerebellum is crucial for making predictions about sensory consequences, whereas basal ganglia relates reward signals and it's important for forming these control policies. Do you have any questions I can help you with? All right. Have a good day.